Hi, uh, thank you all for having me this afternoon. Uh, my name is Teresa. I'm a master's student working with uh, Zev. Um, and today my presentation will be an overview of my master's project, which is a study of wildfire dynamics in Jasper National Park. Um, so my project is a reconstruction of the fire history using um, the hybrid approach of tree ring evidence. Um, and I'll use this fire history to determine the control of wildfire dynamics um, in, the, in the area, so when and why fires occurred historically. Uh, I'm working with Gerald Tonde's master's data set um, that was collected in the late 1970s, and obviously there have been some uh, analytical um, advancements. So I'll be reanalyzing his cross-section samples using modern dendro techniques. Um, I'll kind of uh, deconstruct what this actually entails a little bit later, but specifically uh, I'll be working to cross-state um, his samples, so accurately dating uh, each ring to its calendar year. Um, so with this reconstruction, I'll be left with an accurate um, wildfire info that has been refined to an annual and sometimes uh, seasonal resolution. And so with this more fine-scale reconstruction, I can ask questions that were not possible before. So uh, questions regarding fire frequency, fire seasonality, and fire severity, and also, again, the control. So what is the fire climate relationship and um, other vegetation dynamics in the area? Um, so this is my data set or um, some representative uh, samples that I have, um, which Lori has uh, kindly given to me, so gigabytes worth of images and data. Um, these were, these samples, about 400 cross-section samples were resurfaced and scanned over at UBC, and they're now being processed at the University of Guelph. I'm mainly working with logical pine and um, some Douglas fir samples, so um, both species that are uh, fire adapted. So these samples here are, have pith and fire scar, scar evidence, so we're talking about this earlier, and this will aid in our reconstruction of a mixed severity fire regime. So our, our fire, a high severity fire uh, event uh, will be detected using coast fire cohort establishment dates and stand origin mapping, and then using the fire stars, we'll be able to date low to moderate severity fire. So, but again, the research gap here is that uh, Gerald did not um, cross data sample, so um, we're not confident in those dates, but also uh, when we are able to um, uh, uh, date each individual fire ring to its calendar year, we'll be able to make inferences about the climate preceding the fire event as well. Um, so um, my my main objective here is to reanalyze this data set using moder modern and analytical techniques. So to get accurate fire dates, um, I'll be using methods such as PIF correction, correction. So for some samples that I've received, um, for whatever reason, um, watch or decay, um, I don't have evidence of the PIF ring. So um, you kind of want to estimate um, the rings uh, the establishment ring, so based on the curvature of the ring, we'll be able to estimate the number of missing rings. And also, uh, our main method here is to visually cross date, so examine the wood and also statistically cross date um, the, each individual ring. So this will allow for analysis that were not previously possible. Um, so with this high resolution data set, uh, my research question is to ask what are the controls on wildfire genetics? So uh, my reconstruction will go back to about approximately the 1600s, so a long temporal chronology and also a broad spatial scale. So about 400 square kilometers um, is the size of the study area around the Jasper town site. Um, so my first um, uh, control on wildfire dynamics that I'll be looking at is climate, so fire climate relationships. So I'll have an annually resolved data set. So um, we can run what is called a superposed epoch analysis. So um, a slide, we'll create a sliding window around the fire event. So we'll have these fire events and we'll uh, analyze the antecedent conditions um, before and after a fire event. Um, so we'll look at um, what the climate was like uh, before a fire event uh, occurs. Um, so typically what we expect here is that um, 
in the years preceding. So we analyzed about five years before a fire event. We expect to see drier conditions, so uh, smaller or below average uh, growth rings. So in these conditions, the fuel on the ground will be able to dry out and a fire event would be able to occur. So in this type of analysis, we can also go further and determine fire seasonality. So we can um, determine when a fire occurred um, so in the late summer or early spring. So depending on um, the position of the scar and their ring structure or their wood anatomy, we can determine if it's a dormant season fire or early wood, uh, early season fire or um, late season fire. And this has important ecological effects. So this is important for um, management. So if we were to uh, reintroduce fire into the system, we also want to know um, when to actually um, have those fires occur. Um, so zooming out, we'll do bit, a bit more of a geospatial analysis, so a broader landscape analysis, so um, the landscape controls on wildfires. Um, so Tande's original project was, again, a 400 square kilometer study area around the Jasper uh, town site. So this had a complex degree of topographic relief, so um, the river valleys, um, mountain forests, and alpine meadows. And we can infer that these um, different vegetation communities or forest types have different fire regimes. Um, so these fire regimes were different across the landscape. Um, so um, this, this again has importance for management purposes. Um, so the landscape is very heterogeneous. So um, we can um, uh, reintroduce fires using different fire extents and fire severities according to these historical fires. Um, also, with this kind of analysis, I'll be able to identify um, uh, areas of the landscape that are at high risk of fire hazard. Um, so, identify areas where uh, repeated fires occur with a high fire frequency. Um, so, all the samples were geolocated and archived in these uh, field sheets. So, I can perform a geospatial um, cluster analysis using these um, landscape characteristics that were written down in Tandy's original field notes. So in his field notes, um, he has um, different uh, landscape uh, characteristics recorded to each site of his. So we can see, do an analysis, was there a difference in the fire regime uh, according to elevation or slope or um, the aspect, so north or south or east or west facing. And also he took information on adaptive conditions, so more of the soil conditions. So it would be interesting to find out um, how do soil conditions impact fire dynamics, if there is a relationship. Um, lastly, I'll do a time series analysis on the fire history. I hope to be able to detect uh, changes in the fire frequency and also other like fire severity and other fire regime metrics um, before and after human settlement. Um, essentially, I want to detect if there has been a fire regime change that has occurred over the past 300 to 400 year record, however long the chronology is. And um, I want to detect things like changes due to suppression so, or fire exclusion from the landscape and also changes in the cultural uses of fire by indigenous cultures or um, just in general discrete events. So was there a change in fire um, around the time the park was uh, created in 1907 or the construction of highways through the park? Um, so the objective of my study is to develop a cross-dated or a, a cross-dated and accurate um, site-specific fire history reconstruction of Jasper National Park. Um, so this will help improve the understanding the understanding of fire and climate landscape dynamics, as well as inform ecologically meaningful land management strategies. Um, so the the types of analysis that I was running. So for example, finding uh, fire seasonality. Seasonality would be important for um, any kind of uh, land management or restoration types of project. Uh, so some project milestones of mine. So I have about 400 uh, cross-section samples um, given to me. And as of today, uh, I have about 300 of them processed, so uh, counted, in our counted and measured in our wind dendro program. So continuing into the summer and the rest of the school year, I will begin to statistically cross state um, these samples. And then the final step will be to run the geospatial analysis using those field notes and bringing the, all that information back together. 
then I'm going to invite Raphael maybe to come up next. Raphael's um, also been working with an existing data set. So the second data set that was collected um, was by the Foothills Research Institute, by the um, Healthy Landscape Group. Thank you. And um, the Natural Disturbance Program, as it was previously called in the Healthy Landscapes Group, is now kind of co-sponsoring this work. And he has been working with that data set to um, supplement it and then also work again with archive samples and supplement to top up that data set. So I'll let Raphael take it from here. So I've been studying uh, historical fire regimes in the mountain forests of Jasper National Park and our um, main objectives were first to reconstruct the fire history and the vegetation dynamics in the mountain forests of Jasper National Park. We, theref we thereafter wanted to differentiate um, mixed from high severity um, fire, his uh, fire histories and we also wanted to evaluate changes in forest structure and composition. So our sites were in, we had 29 sites and eight transects on both sides of, of the Athabasca River Valley. Um, and we resampled uh, many of the sites from FRI, uh, which were first sampled between 1997 and 2000. This graph is uh, one of 29 graphs. On the uh, y-axis, we have the number of trees, frequency, and which could be, in this case, um, I think there are 17 trees here, but it was a maximum of 20 trees, uh, which were aged. And on the x-axis, we have the year of establishment in 15-year classes. Each one of these squares represents a tree. The grays are uh, Douglas fir, the whites are spruce, and the blacks are lodgepole pine. The black squares at the top represent a fire scar year, and the white triangle represents a cohort, uh, when the cohort first established. What we wanted to do with this graph was to use the fire scars in the cohorts in order to classify the fire histories as either mixed or uh, high severity. I will show you examples of mixed and high severity sites. For example, here at the top we have a site which had several fire scars, more than two. And at the bottom we have one site which has one fire scar, however has veteran trees preceding that fire scar. We classify these examples as mixed severity fire history sites. And to, con to contrast this, we have some fire high severity fire history sites. At the top, we have just the cohort, no fire scars, and at the bottom, we have a cohort coinciding with the fire scar. This is a composite of each plot, so we have a fire record for each plot. The uh, white triangles are uh, a, a cohort, uh, the cohort establishment, and the vertical, the, the vertical bars are um, uh, fire scar years. And if you look down here at the composites, we realize that there's um, each one bar represents a fire scar year. And prior to the 1900s, there's ample evidence of um, low to moderate severity fires over the landscape because these are due to fire scars. However, post 1900s, we do not see any evidence of fire scars. To resume what we saw in this graph, we see that historically there were mixed and high severity fires which burned in the mountain forests, and that the abundant fire scars are indicating low to moderate severity fires which burned prior to the 1900s, prior to the early 1900s. And these even age cohorts, which um, originated after large fires, so a large fire were the ones that um, affected more, at least five sites. And for example, in 1772, 1827, 1889, 19, 1904, um, released cohorts which currently dominate the forest canopies. And finally, other results that, were, that I would like to present to you is that the dominant trees were lodgepole pine, followed by Douglas fir and spruce, uh, and although spruce in the subcanopy uh, has is is very dominant, uh, we've also found that the oldest trees were from the mid uh, 1500s. Those were also spruce, 
and 18% of our age cores, so we aged 537 trees. These established between 1820 and 1920, so probably after those widespread fires. And 93% and of those trees were in cohorts dominated by both spruce or pine, or both those species or either or. I want to just answer, address this last question just briefly with a series of diagrams, and I've definitely gone over time <laughs> amongst the three of us here. So let me wrap this section up with coming back to this question about management implications that stand in landscape scales. And I want to um, show you a conceptual diagram that shows how fire severity and fire frequency interrelate and um, influence fire regimes across environmental gradients. So when we think about fire, if you think about even a really good campfire, you need your fuels and you need your fuels to be dry enough in order to burn. Same thing's gonna happen here. What this graph is showing us is along the environmental gradients going from very dry to very wet on the x-axis, we're going to have trade-offs between fuel availability um, in the green and fuel combustibility in the red. And that's going to drive fire frequency. So what we find is where we have the driest ecosystems, say deserts, we're going to have low fuel availability, but it's going to be highly combustible. But fires can't spread where you have lack of plant productivity, so you get low fire frequency. Out here in very wet systems, there's lots of fuel, but it's not very dry. So again, fire frequency is low. We get this Goldilocks effect, kind of this intermediate perfect spot somewhere in the middle where we have just enough fuel that becomes dry enough during the fire season that it's going to burn and you get fires burning frequently. If we add ecosystems then along the bottom, oh, and fire severity is going to be inversely related to that where you have high frequencies, you have little fuel buildup from fire to fire, and the severity of those fires then tends to be low. Its impact on the vegetation is low. Where you have longer intervals with lower, lower frequency, long intervals, then you're gonna get fuels building up and the fires will be severe they'll have higher impacts. So if they add our ecosystems now, we can add deserts in the driest end, coastal rainforests over on the wet end. And what we see starting with grasslands being where we have highest frequency, we can move up a gradient then, kind of like up a mountainside, where we go to woodlands, where we go to montane forests, where we go to in British Columbia interior rainforest, but also up into our subalpine forests. And our boreal forests are gonna fit somewhere in this transect where it also we're having fairly wet conditions where we have longer intervals and severe fires when they do burn the stand replacing dominant um, with other fire effects mixed in. So from this fire regime diagram, then we can begin to think about ways that our cumulative impacts on the landscape are having effects that might influence these fire regimes. And the two examples I wanted to give you today were changes of or due to climate and changes um, due to mountain pine beetle, another issue that we're not addressing in this research but has implications for fire regimes. So what happens when we change climate, when we add global warming into our, our um, model here, is that combustibility increases. And it increases in a way um, that is enhanced when we're on the wetter end of the spectrum. So because these are the systems that are waiting for the hot, dry fire weather in order to burn, when we make it warmer and drier, their chance of burning is increasing substantively. And so what we see here is a shift then with fire risk increasing in particular in our montane, our interior rainforest, in our boreal and subalpine forests. So those are the ones, and this is documented, this is showing up in the fire records now, that we are getting um, bigger fires that are more severe in some of these wetter forest types. The second, if we add beetles to the mix, mountain pine beetle having a huge impact in our forests in the west, what we do now is increased fuel availability, and we do that again largely on that higher end of the spectrum where we had more lodgepole pine in our montane to interior, montane, subalpine, and boreal forests. And so what we end up with is a cumulative effect that both increases fire frequency and increases severity. And so the cartoon here is intended to show that when we start having these interactions, these, these factors at play, 
we can have significant changes to our fire regimes in the coming decades as we move forward. And I think the more that we can understand now about what the historic conditions were, what were the conditions under which fires burned, what were their severity and impacts on the vegetation in terms of composition and structure, and the more we can understand long-term in the past, it gives us better frameworks and better understanding um, of the conditions and the risk as we move forward and try to quantify some of these conceptual um, changes that are happening, that are underway now and are proposed to happen as we move into the future as well. So back to those burning questions to sum up, the students are addressing that first one. How important is this at the landscape? And as we begin to compile our results over the next couple of years, we hope too that we'll be able to bring these back to management implications and management being for both forest managers and um, park managers and those who are aiming to um, improve our conservation and improve the sustainability of our forest resources.